Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Cook. Welcome once again to another edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Graham Hancock. He is the author of the major international nonfiction bestsellers, Magicians of the Gods, The Sign and the Soul, Fingerprints of the Gods, Message of the Sphinx, Heaven's Mirror, Underworld and Supernatural, and of the epic adventure novels Entangled and War God. His books have sold more than 7 million copies worldwide and have been translated into 30 languages. His public lectures, radio, and TV appearances, including two major TV series, Quests for the Lost Civilization and Flooded Kingdoms of the Ice Age, as well as his strong presence on the Internet, have put his ideas before audiences of tens of millions. He's become recognized as an unconventional thinker who raises resonant questions about humanity's past and about our present predicament. Uh, That's an impressive resume, and so is this book. The book is America Before, the Key to Earth's Lost Civilization. Mr. Hancock, welcome to the program. Nice to talk to you. Thanks for having me on the show. This book makes a case for an ancient civilization that is very technologically advanced uh, that – may have helped other civilizations rise to the levels that they did with their knowledge. I, I saw reference early on to Atlantis and uh, of course, Aristotle refers to Atlantis and then a a 60s folk singer named uh, Donovan and and, uh, uh, a couple of American movie makers. But but by the way, the, the original source of the Atlantis story, or at least the earliest surviving source is in the works of Plato. Uh, Mm -hmm. In the dialogues, Timaeus and and Critias, Aristotle does indeed comment on Plato's references to Atlantis, but the original source is Plato. And Plato, in turn, says he got the information through his family line from his ancestor, the famous Greek lawmaker Solon, who visited Egypt around the year 600 BC. This is a well-documented visit upon which many ancient writers commented. Uh, And Solon in Egypt claimed to have been told by Egyptian priests the story of Atlantis, of how there was once this great uh, civilization capable of navigating and exploring the world, uh, which was powerful but gentle and nurturing, but which gradually became corrupt uh, and evil and imposed its will around the world and then was struck down by the universe with a, a cataclysmic flood. And Plato, Mm -hmm. in his story, gives us a date for the destruction of Atlantis. Uh, Those Egyptian priests who gave the story to Solon told Solon that it happened 9,000 years before his visit. We know his visit was in 600 BC, so that gives us the date of the destruction of Atlantis, 9,600 BC in our calendar, or roughly 11,600 years ago. And one of the amazing facts that I draw attention to in this book is that that date is highly significant. 11,600 years ago is the date of what geologists call Meltwater Pulse 1b, a massive meltdown of what was then the North American ice cap, because we were in the Ice Age at that point, a huge rise in global sea levels and cataclysmic Mm -hmm. flooding, tearing apart huge areas of North America, of which the most famous and most obvious are the channeled scablands in the Pacific Northwest in Washington State. So what's fascinating, although archaeologists tend to dismiss Plato and say that his story of Atlantis was just a fantasy that he made up to make some kind of political point, what's fascinating is that the date he gives us coincides with the latest scientific information on cataclysmic events, flooding and sea level rise at the end of the last ice age. And the dating is very, very precise. So this, I feel, is a reason to take Plato more seriously about the lost civilization of Atlantis. And then, excuse me for going on at great length, but I want to make one other point, which is Plato also tells us where Atlantis was and what it was. He tells us that it was an enormous island that lay west of the Pillars of Hercules. Today we call the Pillars of Hercules the Straits of Gibraltar. In other words, it lay west of Europe, across the Atlantic Ocean, far across the Atlantic Ocean. And he said this island was larger than Africa and Asia added together. There's only one landmass that fits the bill, and that's the Americas, North, Central, and South America, 
fit the bill precisely of Plato's description and the dating of the destruction of Atlantis that Plato gives us fits perfectly with the latest uh, scientific information. So uh, I think this is an important point and it's a, it's, it's, it's a point that I make strongly and reinforce and document in the book. Yes, and, and, and it is so well documented. Uh, you, you speak coherently and articulately uh, from the sciences of paleontology, archaeology, anthropology, astronomy, geometry, uh, agriculture, and all of it fits together so neatly it's, it's hard to decide exactly where to start. Uh, the, I w went to school shortly after the last Ice Age myself, and so I <laughs> was schooled in the, con the conventional <laughs> wisdom. <laughs> the yeah. conventional wisdom that, you know, the, the, there was this pristine continent that didn't have humans in it until uh, the last Ice Age lowered the waters so that they could cross the Bering Strait, and these hunter-gatherers moved down into North America and hunted giant mammoths to extinction. But there's a lot of evidence that contradicts that, isn't there? <laughs> well, again, this is an important point uh, because uh, the, the professionals who we entrust with interpreting our past to us, the experts, the specialists in this field, are archaeologists. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're very possessive of their field, and they don't like other people uh, sticking their noses into the field of archaeology. Archaeologists feel that it's their territory. Uh, so they mm -hmm. better be right in what they're saying. Uh, and unfortunately, on the matter of the peopling of the Americas, it has emerged just in the last five years that archaeologists were absolutely, totally, 100 percent, completely and utterly wrong about the peopling of the Americas. And what was taught to us in school, what was taught to you and me, what was taught to generations of students over 60 years in schools and universities was what is called the Clovis First Model, that a culture that archaeologists call the Clovis culture crossed over from Siberia. As you rightly said, they crossed a land bridge, which archaeologists call Beringia, the Bering Straits are there today. But sea level was much lower during the Ice Age, 400 feet lower than it is today. So that landmass was exposed. They crossed over from Siberia. Uh, they came down into North America, and they are supposed to have been the first Americans. And their entry into America is supposed to have been just 13,000 years ago, making America uh, the last of the Earth's great land masses to have been settled by human beings. And this model was rigidly and firmly taught. And any archaeologist who disputed it, Jack Sank Mars, who excavated bluefish caves in the Yukon, Al Goodyear, who excavated Topper in South Carolina, both producing evidence of humans in the Americas tens of thousands of years before Clovis, uh, they were subjected to the most vicious and unpleasant attacks by their colleagues. Uh, Jacques Saint Mars actually had his research funding withdrawn because he dared to suggest that Clovis was not first. But little by little, gradually, the new evidence has kept on coming in, and it's now come to the point where it's overwhelmed the pre-existing paradigm. And all archaeologists must now shamefacedly admit that Clovis first was nonsense from beginning to end, and it led to a neglect of roughly 100,000 years of American prehistory when humans were in America, but archaeologists weren't looking for what they did because their dogma convinced them that there were no humans there then. Mm -hmm. you, have, you titled one chapter, A Past, Not So Much Hidden as Denied, and that fits with what, what you've been talking about to this point. Let's look at some tidbits of evidence. Uh, the DNA evidence is really interesting to me, uh, yeah. the, the traces of evidence of genes from the Australian and uh, Indonesian cultures somehow made it to South America. Well, yeah, and again, this is, this is one of the pieces of evidence that gives the lie to the old notion of the peopling of the Americas. The old notion of the peopling of the Americas is that it happened entirely from East Asia and Siberia, that it was a land uh, migration, perhaps with some coastal rafting uh, added to it, clinging close to the coastlines. Um, and, and entering first North America and then traveling down through North America into Central America and finally into South America. But here's the problem. In the heart of the Amazon jungle, there are a number of tribes whose DNA is closely related to the DNA of Australian Aborigines and Melanesians from Papua New Guinea. Let's call them 
Australasians. And this Australasian DNA signal in the Amazon is incredibly puzzling. Firstly, because we know it's very old. Ancient skeletal remains contain the same signal and they go right back into the last ice age. And secondly, because there's no trace of it in North America or Central America. And if the migration was by land or by coast hugging rafts, you would expect to find that DNA signal distributed evenly throughout the Americas, everywhere along the route of migration, but it's not. It's only found in the heart of the Amazon rainforest. It's, more, it's been there for more than 12,000 years, and the indication, the only way it could have got there was by a transoceanic voyage during the Ice Age. Somebody was able to cross the Pacific Ocean and carry a reproductively viable population across the Pacific Ocean during the last ice age. And that in itself completely rewrites history because archaeologists don't accept that such voyages were possible until around 3,000 or 3,500 years ago. For them to have happened 12 or 13,000 years ago uh, is considered by archaeologists to be absolutely impossible. But then they are confronted by this revealing DNA signal in the Amazon, which says not only was it possible, but it actually happened. Since we're talking about the Amazon, let, let's delve into the fact that there were some highly populous civilizations, which doesn't make sense by conventional wisdom, given that the rainforest is not conducive to agriculture and so on. And yet early explorers described large cities along the Amazon and its tributaries. Correct. Uh, for example, Francisco de Orellana, who was the first European to cross the whole width of, the, uh, of South America, and he traveled the Amazon River system uh, from Ecuador all the way to the Atlantic Ocean in the middle of the 16th century, and he reported the existence of huge advanced cities in the Amazon and of enormous populations and of highly sophisticated arts and crafts. A hundred years later, when other Europeans followed his route and went into the Amazon, they couldn't find these cities. They just found dense jungle everywhere. And they came to the conclusion that Oriana had kind of fantasized the whole thing and made it up to make himself look big as an explorer. Uh, but 300 years later, 400 years later, we now know that Oriana was telling the truth. And this is because of the tragic clearances of the Amazon rainforest to make way for cattle ranches and soya bean farms. And as those dense old growth rainforest trees have been cut down, what has been revealed is the traces of those enormous cities. Uh, and archaeologists now accept that there were cities in the Amazon a thousand, two thousand years ago, which were larger than any of the cities in Europe at that time. Uh, and a population just before the Spanish conquest estimated at around 20 million people. And this is a huge anomaly because, as you rightly say, rainforest soils are not partic particularly fertile or productive. Uh, and this is where we find evidence of science in the Amazon because more than 8,000 years ago, again, edging back towards the end of the last ice age, some culture in the Amazon invented a soil. It's called terra preta or black earth. Um, Amazonian dark earth is another name for it. It's a, it's a, it's a miracle soil. Uh, it contains millions of species of bacteria that are not found in neighboring soils, um, and it is incredibly fertile. You can take a handful of 8,000-year-old terra preta and add it to barren soil, and it will turn that soil fertile in an instant. It's just one amongst many evidences of ancient high science in the Amazon. And another, again, revealed by these horrific clearances of the rainforest, but at least to our advantage in terms of accumulating knowledge, has been the appearance of gigantic geometrical constructions in the Amazon. Huge earthworks, which are very like the earthworks of the Mississippi Valley in North America, as a matter of fact, with very intense, very precise geometries. And even stone circles, megalithic circles like Stonehenge in England are also found in the Amazon. And all of this is completely unexpected. And last but not least, it turns out that the Amazon rainforest itself is not a pristine natural wilderness. It's a giant five million square kilometer garden that was created by human beings with the preference focused on trees that produced food and other useful materials for human beings. Those 
those trees and plants that are useful to human beings are hyperdominant in the Amazon, and they bear witness to a deliberate, if you like, gardening project on an enormous scale uh, in the Amazon. The, the Amazon is huge, millions of square kilometers, larger than the whole of the Indian subcontinent, and hardly any of it has yet been surveyed by archaeologists. But the bits that have been surveyed are changing everything about our understanding of the past. And this was another area where the archaeologist uh, hung, clung to conventional wisdom. Well, there's nothing there, so there's no need to explore it. And yet exactly. uh, this exactly. clearing is finding out so many interesting things. Yeah, exactly. The feeling was that there was no point. It's, it's, it's expensive to work in the Amazon, let's face it. And the feeling amongst archaeologists was, what's the point? Um, what's the point of spending all that money when we could be spending it in other areas where we know we're going to find stuff? Um, but now that we have these clearances in the Amazon and incredibly interesting sites are being revealed, I mean, I'm talking about uh, gigantic earthworks on the scale of thousands of feet with, with huge embankments, circles, squares, rectangles, triangles, all these geometrical figures. Now that we see that, it's obvious. And, and we see the evidence for a huge population in the Amazon, it's obvious that the story of the Amazon has not been told correctly. And this is part of a, an overall review of the whole prehistory of the Americas, latest science in many fields that I've tried to bring together in this book so that the general public can be aware of what's happening because these developments until now have largely been confined to obscure and specialist scientific journals. And I felt it was time to get this information out into the public domain. And I, am, I for one, am grateful. I, 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 since we mentioned geometry, I want to tie it into the sun and the moon and the, yeah. the stars. Uh, what's the best yes. way to approach that? <laughs> well, the best, the best way to approach that, I mean, I, 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 I saw this for myself uh, in, um, uh, on the summer solstice in 2017. Summer solstice, as, mm -hmm. as you know, as your listeners know, is the longest day of the year in the northern hemisphere. It's the place when the sun rises at its furthest point north of east before beginning to track back south of east. And it'll rise at its furthest point south of east on the winter solstice. So the summer solstice, 21st of June uh, in our calendar, I was at Serpent Mound in 2017 and i was there with my wife santa who's a photographer and we were able to put a drone up 400 feet above serpent mound so that you can see the massive man-made serpent which is 1400 feet in length with triangular gaping open jaws and you can see the sun and then it was just magical to watch the sun descending towards the horizon and then to enter a niche in the horizon and at that very moment lining up perfectly targeted like the sight on the barrel of a rifle uh, by Serpent Mound, by the open jaws of Serpent Mound, targeting exactly the setting point of the sun on the summer solstice. And this, this tells us that, uh, that the ancients were, that it was extremely important to the ancients to celebrate what I call the marriage of heaven and earth of earth whispering to sky to re-emphasize and make the point that we aren't just earthbound creatures, that we're part of a cosmos. Um, if you go to um, Newark, uh, in, uh, also in Ohio, another of these great earthwork sites, uh, you'll find that there's a, amongst many geometrical figures, there's a huge earthwork complex that consists of a circle joined to an octagon, again on the scale of thousands of feet. And every one of the key points on this gigantic figure targets essential moments in the story of the moon. Not many people know this, but the moon has a cycle of 18.6 years, just like the sun over that 18.6 years, it'll rise furthest north of east and furthest south of east, and then it'll, the cycle will repeat. And all of these key points are targeted by this huge octagon circle combination at Newark, and they're targeted with extremely high precision. And then just 60 miles from Newark is High Bank Works, where another circle octagon figure appears, uh, almost identical uh, to the one at Newark. And the um, amazing mystery is that although Newark and High Bank are 60 miles apart, the circle octagon figure at Newark is oriented at precisely 90 degrees to the circle octagon figure at High Bank. And to do that across a distance of 60 miles with such uncanny precision is the work of a high civilization. We have to reconsider everything we've thought about Native American cultures. 
these were much more than simple hunter-gatherers. These were highly sophisticated civilizations that had mastered skills and techniques that we ourselves have only got on top of uh, in the last century or two. And one possibility you suggest is that it could be that highly civilized, uh, technologically advanced folks could live amongst the hunter-gatherers and share that knowledge with them. Yes, as we do today, because because the the world is not so different. We we live in in a world today in which we have a very advanced technological civilization, but we coexist with hunter gatherers. There are hunter gatherers in the Amazon rainforest who don't even know our civilization exists. The so-called uncontacted tribes. There are hunter gatherers in the Namibian desert. They know we exist, but they don't want to have anything to do with us. They continue and live their traditional hunter gatherer lifestyle. And I think it was the same during the Ice Age. I think there was a high civilization on the planet, and I think there were many hunter gatherer cultures on the planet as well. And then came a gigantic global cataclysm that unfolded between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. And remember, 11,600 years ago is the date for the destruction of Atlantis. And this period is called by geologists the Younger Dryas. It's the period in which all the megafauna, the mammoths, the mastodons, the woolly rhinos, the giant sloths, the saber-toothed tigers, they all went extinct at that time. There's evidence of massive disruption of human populations as well. And I suggest what happened was hunter-gatherers are in the business of survival. People from advanced civilizations are not. Very few people in our culture have any knowledge of survival. If we were afflicted by the same level of cataclysm that hit the earth between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, it would not be the descendants of those of us who live in the so-called advanced civilizations who would carry forward the human story. Our civilizations would fall apart. It would be the hunter-gatherers who would carry forward the human story because they are in the business of survival. They're masters of survival, and they would weather a global cataclysm uh, in a way that we could not. And I suggest that it was the same uh, in the Ice Age, and that there were survivors of the lost civilization, that they took refuge amongst hunter-gatherer populations all around the world. They taught them as much as they could of what they knew, and they deliberately passed on certain very specific spiritual ideas that are connected to those geometrical figures that are built on the ground. And that's why we find cultures all around the world having common features, even though those cultures were not in direct contact. The reason they share so much is because they all inherited a legacy from a remote third-party civilization, an ancestor civilization that was the shared ancestor of all of them. Yeah, and you, you mentioned the, the link between the Mississippian indigenous in North America and Egypt, and that's, uh, that's yeah. a pretty long distance. To, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a remarkable thing, and, and it took me by surprise when, <clears throat> when I was researching this book, because I have a, a very deep and long background in ancient Egypt. I, I would say that ancient Egypt is the ancient culture that I've studied more comprehensively than any other, and I'm very well informed about the ancient Egyptian spiritual system. And I'm just going to summarize it for you very, very quickly. It sounds kind of crazy. We don't have to buy into it. All we have to know is this is what the ancient Egyptians believed. They believed that on death, our souls leave our bodies and rise up to the constellation of Orion, which is a kind of portal in the sky. And the soul then passes through that portal to the banks of the Milky Way. Orion stands very close to the Milky Way. And then a journey is made along the Milky Way where the soul will be challenged and confronted with the life that it has lived and required to answer uh, for every action, every choice, every decision made during that life uh, and, and, and confronted by monsters and challenges that the soul must gird its will up in order to face. And exactly the same system of ideas is found, for example, at Moundville in Alabama. Uh, in uh, the United States. Uh, the Ma Ma Moundville was one of the uh, very important mound builder cultures in the Mississippi Valley. Uh, their iconography has survived. There are even surviving tribes who are related to the Moundville people. And what has been found is that their beliefs about the afterlife journey of the soul 
are identical to those of the ancient Egyptians, involving, again, the constellation of Orion, a leap to the sky, to the constellation of Orion, a journey along the Milky Way, and so on and so forth. And I just don't feel, of course, we don't have time to go into it in detail now, but I, I documented at great length in the book. I don't feel this can be some kind of weird coincidence. The details are way too detailed for that. Again, I think the answer is that both ancient Egypt and the Mississippi Valley civilization received a legacy from an earlier lost civilization. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that makes me spring to mind a couple of other things that we want to make sure we touch on before our last five minutes are up. Uh, one yeah. of them is if they continued, if these wise, knowledgeable people continue to live among us, uh, let's call it the ignorant masses, they live among us, yeah. that there might be examples of that. I mean, I think of Leonardo, whose genius in engineering far exceeded his genius in painting. And he designed so much that made it possible for building of great cathedrals and other things that he designed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is this is precisely what we see, and it kicks in roughly from 11,600 years ago onwards all around the world is the sudden appearance of very sophisticated uh, geometrical structures, whether it's in the, in the great earthworks of North America or whether, for example, it's the, the, the site of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, uh, a giant megalithic site that is, in fact, 11,600 years old. That's 6,000 years older than Stonehenge. Uh, in the UK, and, and Gobekli Tepe, like the American sites, is filled with complex, very precise geometry. And you have to ask yourself, how did a group of hunter-gatherers wake up one morning magically equipped <laughs> with the knowledge to build the largest megalithic site on Earth, and magically mm -hmm. equipped with the knowledge of the geometry and the astronomy? I don't think there was any magic at all. I think we're looking at evidence of a legacy, a legacy of yeah. ideas. This was an, a legacy of ideas passed on from the survivors of a lost civilization. I do want to touch on plant gnosis because you mentioned ayahuasca and, yeah. and how there are other ways of achieving knowledge besides typical scientific there, inquiry. There, there are, and, and this has been a parallel interest of mine for, for many years. I, I've, I've written a book about the plant medicines called Supernatural Meetings with the Ancient Teachers of Mankind. I've had more than 70 sessions with uh, ayahuasca myself. Um, and I would suggest that the lost civilization we are dealing with is a civilization that made use of the plant medicines, that made use of these visionary plants in order to access knowledge. Our culture today demonizes these visual, visionary plants and will even send people to prison for making use of them, although it beats me what right any government has to interfere with the inner state of mind of an individual adult so long as that adult does no harm to others. But nonetheless, that's the world we live in today, and our governments claim that they own the keys to our consciousness. This was not how it was uh, in ancient times. These plants were revered. They were regarded as deities and as teachers, and indeed new knowledge does arise from them. I can, I can speak to that directly from, from my own experience. I didn't know that I could write novels. I've made my living writing nonfiction books, but after a series of sessions with ayahuasca in the Amazon, I was given an entire no novel, the whole story of the novel, and I ended up writing it. Uh, my readers <laughs> much prefer my nonfiction, but the very fact that I could undertake <laughs> this creative endeavor that I had not undertaken before or even considered that I could undertake means that novelty was introduced into my life uh, as a result of the ayahuasca experience. And I think we need, we need more of that. We need to break the chains of fixed and rigid ideas. And the plant medicines can help us to do that, so long as they are used responsibly, with respect, uh, and in a sacred setting. Yes, I, I, I'm acquainted with an underground group that, that does uh, shamanic ceremonies uh, with ayahuasca, both in the U.S. and in Mexico, and mm -hmm. uh, they refer to it as the grandmother, and it's a very holy moment for them when they go through absolutely. the experience. Ab mm -hmm. ab ab absolutely. I mean, scientists will mock at this because for science, there is no, there is no spirit world. Uh, scientists want to weigh and measure and count everything. People like Richard Dawkins, the author of The Selfish Gene, uh, or the God delusion, they, they see us as just a kind of meat robot. Uh, responding to the, the accidental results of evolution and that there's no such thing as the soul or the spirit. Uh, but we don't, we, don't really, we don't really know that at all. That's not a fact. That's actually a scientific belief system. There are no experiments that have proved that. 
And although scientists mock me for saying this, I think with ayahuasca, we are dealing with a goddess. It's not an accident that people in the West are calling her Mother Ayahuasca or the Grandmother. Mm -hmm. And I think she's the mm -hmm. mother goddess of our planet. And uh, I think the reason that ayahuasca is spreading around the world right now, and don't forget ayahuasca is a vine that originated in the Amazon jungle, now spreading all around the world. An ayahuasca ceremony can be had in any great city. And it may sound whimsical or even poetic, uh, but I think uh, we're being offered the opportunity to save ourselves at perhaps the very last moment, because the human species is in a mess right now, and we can't go on mm. doing things the way we've done them in the past. We have to make changes. Yes, even if the mammoths weren't hunted to extinction, the oceans are being fished to extinction right now. Um, and and so much uh, hatred and fear and suspicion in the world, and such an absence of love, and such an absence mm -hmm. of concern and care for others, or, 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 or we will only care for others if they, if they belong to our nation state, whereas other nation states are regarded as our enemies to be destroyed. This is folly. This is, this is us locked in our past. We have to move on from this if we're going to graduate as a species into our true potential. And I think mm -hmm. we can learn a lot from studying the ancient civilization as we try to fashion this new way forward. Thank you for that. I, I do want to touch on the fact that the wiping down of the North American crime scene is, is problematic as we investigate uh, this because we're losing evidence of the ancient civilizations to land development and mining and whatever else Absolutely. we use those things, things for. It's a plain fact yeah. that 90% of the magnificent Native American earthworks that were documented in the 19th century no longer exist today. They've been plowed mm -hmm. under for agricultural land or turned into housing estates or industrial parks. Uh, we have just willfully obliterated pages and pages of our own past and then take into account the effects of that huge cataclysm with the meltdown of the ice caps in North America between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, the literal scouring of the land. We've not had a chance to go into this in this discussion, but I go into it in detail in the book. America was ripped apart in that period, and that also got rid of a lot of evidence. So we have a hard challenge ahead of us, but if we don't respond to that challenge, we'll never learn who we really are or where we came from. Mm -hmm. And one last thing that, that uh, is sad is the ethnocentric destruction of knowledge, the, the burning of the library in Alexandria, the destruction of the codices of, of the Mayans based upon some fear that it's the wrong religion. Absolutely. It's like a madman smashing out his own brains with a hammer. Why would we do that? Why did the Spanish priests heap up thousands of Mayan books and just burn them? Who knows what we lost in that conflagration? What knowledge of our own past was willfully destroyed then? You're right. The Library of Alexandria, another example of an archive of ancient knowledge reaching back into remote prehistory destroyed by burning. We've lost so much of our own past. We, we forget far more about our past than we remember. Uh, and and uh, if I'm motivated by anything, it's to, to trigger those memories and to, and, and to bring them back into the world again. And I want to express my gratitude. Unfortunately, we're out of time. We've been talking with Ram Hancock. The book is America Before, The Key to Earth's Lost Civilization. It's a must read. I remind our listeners that if you don't catch our regularly scheduled broadcast, you can pick up this story on YouTube at our YouTube channel, Good Books Radio Strong and Cook. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. Thanks for listening and make it a great day.